Jade Cocoon was one of those rare few games to dare compete directly with Final Fantasy as an RPG on the PlayStation 1. It lacked the scale, the depth and the polish of Square Enix's epics, but it would be an injustice to call it a cheap rip-off of the Final Fantasy series. So look underneath the surface and you'll find a surprisingly ambitious and likeable little title, even if it feels cheap and unpolished in places. A large part of this game's appeal is thanks to it having one of the best soundtracks that I have ever heard. It's genuinely musical and enchanting, and has played a large part in getting me to like this game as much as I do. You play as a cocoon master, a dangerous and solitary profession where you explore the mysteries of the forest, battling creatures along the way. Judging from his clothing, he's sponsored by Steel Series. Honestly, I kind of switched off from the storyline, which focuses heavily on magic and spirits, with a dash of bestiality, judging from the beginning movie. It all begins with you suffering from nightmares where you get repeatedly shat on in combat by an OP guy who haunts your dreams. This bit goes on for way too long, but it becomes a lot better once you're free to go out and to explore the forest. Similar to Final Fantasy, the majority of this game is spent exploring pre-rendered backdrops, which I actually really like. There are certainly things from the PlayStation 1 era that have aged far worse. Between areas, there are loading screens aplenty, but most are done in a second or so. And unlike Final Fantasy, where you'll get sucked into battles without warning or reason, in this game you get to see the enemies roaming the environments and even have the opportunity to evade them if you're skillful enough, which is difficult given the fiddly racing car movement your character possesses. Some of these creatures actively go out of their way to attack you, some are indifferent, some even try to run away. It's a very nice little touch that made it a much more interesting experience. Once you're engaged in combat, you only ever control one character at once, so these battles lack the depth that those in Final Fantasy might have. The sprite backgrounds are distractingly buggy and some of the transitions between moves and attacks are rather long and can begin to grind. One thing I do like though is how there's always something happening. In Final Fantasy there's often downtime as you wait for the next character to ready their turn, but this game cuts to the chase, letting the next person make his move the moment the previous one has ended. Even if the end result is still slower than in Final Fantasy games, it makes more sense and as a result feels less frustrating. You can attack these creatures using either your main character or one of your own summoned creatures. You can kill them outright through XP, or once they're weak enough, can capture them in cocoons. Sort of like Pokemon, but definitely not Pokemon. But maybe. After you do this, you can use these monsters to fight for you, or combine them with others to level up their stats and abilities, genetically engineering your own super monsters. This was a large part of the game's appeal back in the day, since you could then pit these creatures against others in the multiplayer arena mode. If you happen to have two controllers, and a friend who also played the game, who had a memory card with their saves on. I wonder how often this feature was used, as it was a pretty unique idea at the time on the PlayStation 1. You can dabble with this feature as much or as little as you like as you fight your way through the four forest areas, returning whenever you like to your village to buy stuff from the local shop or to hear tales from the elders. This village hub is a surprisingly fleshed out experience, which is just as well since it is your only real encounter with civilization throughout the game's story. NPCs all have their stories to tell and hilariously believe that you actually care. It's a real relic of games from long ago, but as a player I just frantically skip the dozens of paragraphs of text to get onto the next playable bit of the game. Sorry NPCs. There are a few shops that regularly stock better and more expensive gear as the game progresses. There are a couple of pointless places as well where you get to meet the village idiot or old people who just babble endlessly about pointless stuff. Then there's your wife, who's only really useful because she can use her magic powers to splice monsters for you. Unfortunately, every time she does this she gains horrendous scars from the process and towards the end looks very sorry for herself. I genuinely began to feel sad for using her like this, though blending my fire monster with my air one was totally worth it. The game carries on like this for a while, with you exploring the forest to get quest items for people in the village. I'm going to warn you now that what I'm about to say contains heavy spoilers and will ruin the experience somewhat if you haven't played this game and are thinking of giving it a go, because you know what happens next? Everybody dies! Like, everyone. No mercy. It makes the Red Wedding look tame. Like, seriously. It was at this moment I sat up and paid attention to this game. Before then I thought I knew the rules. I knew what the writers were capable of and how the storyline would pan out. And then it goes and tips it all on its head. Combined with a genuinely emotional tune, this bit of the game has stuck with me as one of the saddest parts of any video game, ever. You can still explore the village, but it's but an empty husk. A cocoon, if you will of its former self, everybody frozen in time from the moment a cataclysmic event takes place. But you still have to move on to finish the magic filled storyline, and it's at this point that the game gets a bit weird. You're then forced to travel through the first four parts of the game again, but with a strange filter over the screen and with tougher enemies. 
Admittedly, I'd struggled a bit with this at the time, as the difficulty level really did seem to be ramped up. This was the most enjoyable part for me, actually. All of the game's elements seem designed for this section where you're alone, with no places to heal or to stock up your items. All of your summons heal a bit after every fight you're involved in, so the whole thing becomes a dangerous balance of healing and battling to gain XP until you're strong enough to beat this section of the game. Had the whole game been like this, then I think the reviews would have been a lot better. But then it raises the stakes further. You can just end the game at this point. But the alternative is the so-called Endless Corridor. It's called that because it never ends. Instead, you're forced down an endless passageway with increasingly difficult enemies and rooms until you die. It feels half finished, as though the second half of the game had to be rewritten quickly due to budget and time constraints. I'm sure I finished this game, but never felt as though I'd been rewarded for it. You can probably complete this game in about a dozen hours, but there's certainly more replayability if you care to master the summons and to craft your own killing machines. You begin to get to know the creatures you've made. You can always trust good old Bessie in a fight, or expect James the runty magic monster to fail you as he dies way too quickly for the fifth time. That endless corridor still haunts me, but I feel this unfinished challenge only adds to the game's mystery. Jay Cocoon is not what you might expect. At first glance, it appears to be a budget Final Fantasy, but it can stand on its own two feet. And if Final Fantasy is a travel lodge, then this is a family-run B&B. It might be smaller and less professionally produced, but it's charming, full of character, and is happy to experiment with ideas that other series dare not touch. And I still have a place in my heart for the game, even if without warning it might suddenly turn around and kill me when I least expect it.